Uh, now we will have the, the last intervention, the last intervention of this uh, session, and it will be by uh, Professor Dr. Johan van der Lanot on crime against humanity. So we we'll listen to your report, uh, and thank you very much in advance. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President, dear members of the tribunal, registers, Marielle, dear ladies and uh, gentlemen, um, this uh, presentation about crimes against uh, humanity originally was not foreseen. We only started it after one year of work. And that gives a good impression about the importance of this topic that we did not took lightly in consideration. What we will try to do today is examine if the facts of torture and forced, in, uh, and forced disappearance to meet the legal requirements needed, the contextual elements, as they say, needed to be considered as crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity, perhaps a short introduction uh, also for the audience. We have violations of human rights, but that's not the same. Crimes against humanity go further. It is only the gross violation of human rights that can be considered as crimes against uh, humanity, in our case, torture, enforced uh, disappearance, also the arbit arbitrary detentions. However, we had not made a specific report on that, so I will not take that in account in our conclusions uh, today. Perhaps we will do that later. In a specific context, and this specific context makes, that's the reason why you have this figure, makes it necessary that the international community acts against these violations. Um, the origin is after the Second World War, we had the figure of war crimes before and after the Second World War, the international community found out that we should go further with acts against uh, crimes against humanity, which is not linked to war warfare and which is much more towards the civilian population. And that ended with the Rome Statute with a codification bring some innovation, some limitations, and the creation of the International Criminal Court. However, in the rules of procedure of our own tribunal, the jurisdiction of the Turkey Tribunal covers human rights conventions ratified by the Republic of Turkey and the respect of the general principles of international law. Turkey did not ratify the Rome Statute, but crimes against humanity are part of customary international law and therefore also under the jurisdiction of the tribunal. However, in the methodology, we have followed, we have taken the most severe criteria all the time. This means when customary international law is more strict, like for instance in the case of torture, we use the definition in the report of torture that is under the customary international law, which means the intention to get confessions and so on, which is not needed in the Rome Statute. And where the Rome Statute is more strict, that is the needed to a policy, we applied the criteria of the Rome Statute. So we wanted, as you could say, we are a bit more stricter than customary international law. What we will say is not about individual responsibility. It's not about that. The fact who is responsible for what are they responsible and not about the jurisdiction, the competence of the national courts or the ICC that are topics certainly interesting and not easy to answer, but not in our report. I will not take too much time on the facts, the facts of tortures and forced uh, disappearance, because we had these reports. We had the estimation of the 3,000 allegations, complaints about torture yearly. We have the 95 well-documented abductions. I will not come back on that. We have the reports on that would be a waste of time. And I will not take into account the arbitrary detentions and the conditions, uh, which is also under Rome Statute one of the elements of uh, crimes against humanity. The presentation, well, the facts, gross human right violations as torture and enforced disappearance, do they meet the legal requirement, what usually is called contextual elements, to be considered as crimes against humanity? And we have two steps, two stages in that. The first step is, do we have an attack? That's how it is called. And the existence of an attack uh, is, uh, has three elements that are crucial. 
First, it must be a course of conduct involving the multiple commission of acts, here acts, torture, and forced disappearance, first. Secondly, the operation, the act must be directed against the civilian population. And thirdly, and that's for the Rome Statute, not for customary law, that operation must be conducted pursuant or in furtherance of a state or organizational policy. I must say that we will see when we have it about course of conduct policy and later on about systematic, these terms are very much linked to each other. It's not always easy to make the clear, clear uh, difference between each element of it. And it is more the global appreciation, I think, that will be determining our efforts. So course of conduct. I have taken some elements from the jurisprudence of the ICC and I think I gave to the register uh, an overview of the, the jurisprudence. So you will allow that me that I will not go too much in detail in that, I'm not saying each time this is from this judgment, this judgment, you find it in the document uh, that I delivered to the tribunal. What we see in this jurisprudence, I will take the third bullet as the one who is most clear on that. So a course of conduct is not designed to capture single isolated acts but describes a serious or overall flow of, of events as opposed to a mere aggregate of random acts. So if you have an act of torture today and without any link, two months later you have it again, and it happens one month later in another place without a link, how cruel, how important this torture could be, it cannot be described as a crime against uh, um, uh, uh, humanity, sorry, because we lack this link between them. It is a random act, it is isolated as, and that cannot be taken in account. It's very important, uh, that element, the course of contact, and we see the words collectively in the second bullet, we see the commonality. There has to be a group of acts. It's very important, and that makes the difference with isolated acts, and secondly, the course of conduct, in, conduct involve multiple commission of acts, which means a few, several, many, that's what we find, but to say there is an attack, this uh, quantitative uh, demand is not very specific. We will find it back in the widespread requirements. The, it must be multiple, more than a few. Now, let's apply these elements to torture and then to abduction. With perhaps, and I make this, this exception, the short period after the coup, the attempt of coup, where it is possible that people were mad, were angry, that we have a spontaneous reaction of police officers, security officers. That's possible, it happened. That doesn't want to say that it's, uh, it's acceptable, but it means that the conditions to uh, consider that part as crimes against humanity is doubtful because th there was probably some, some impulsive reaction to react on what happened. But making exception for that period, we cannot uh, not ignore that the acts of torture as it has been described in the reports as it has been testified by test witnesses here we cannot see them as a spontaneous act of individual security officers or simply as a mere aggregate of random act. There is a course of contact. We see the torture to obtain confessions from the terrorists. We see to get new so-called terrorist names. We see a system in how it works. And we also see that the systematically, and I already used that word, it's very clear in who they target, the specific group targets, targeted groups of uh, people belonging to the Gulen movement, people belonging to the Kurdish movement, people opposing. There is some, you cannot say it's hazardous, you cannot say it is random. There is a pattern in it. And of course, the acts of court torture fulfill the needed quantitative threshold. There are more than a few. It is a bit cynical to say that today it's more than a few if we have 3,000 allegations and perhaps more uh, in a year. It's a bit hard to say that it's more than a few. 
So I think this torture system, that what we see that happened, it's not hazardous. There is a system in it. There is a pattern in it, and it's directed to uh, targeted groups. For enforced disappearance, it's even more, it's easier because, yeah, the nature of an abduction itself is not something that is hazardous. It's not something that suddenly happens. It's not so that suddenly a policeman says, okay, we will capture today someone. That doesn't go like that. We saw that the actions were with many of them, were organized. They, you need to have a place where you put the person in a specific place, specific infrastructure. And we saw afterwards that they were delivered between brackets to the police, and nearly always the same discovered as, as such, uh, whatever spontaneous uh, coming to the police. You cannot have abductions in 95 cases without being prepared, and even one case of abduction nearly is impossible. So I think the intense preparation, the secret detention facilities, the acts of abduction himself cannot be seen as spontaneous acts of individual security officers. Uh, and the specific group, which certainly for the last period nearly completely, or not completely, but nearly completely, uh, people belonging to the Gulen movement, makes us uh, to conclude that indeed this is uh, a conduct, that this is something that is a pattern that we can discover. The act must be directed against a civilian population. Of course, I already told, we coming from a system of war crimes to crimes against humanity and in addition to the international criminal law, if I can say, and so it is not longer an act against the military of from militaries. The, it is the civil population who is involved, and that we see the civil population comprises all persons who are civilians, as opposed to members of armed forces and other legitimate combatants. But that's not enough. Uh, because we see that the qualifier, any civil population, means groups distinguishable by nationality, ethnicity, or other distinguishing features. The civilian population targeted can include a group defined by its perceived political affiliation. So it is a group that has to be identifiable. The term civilian population, we see that's the last bullet, denotes a collective as opposed to individual civilians. So it is not said it is directed against a civil person, it is said it is directed against a civil population. The term population means that it is about a group. It's not about an individual. And that's an important nuance we have to make. As far as the Turkish situation is, there's no against military, there is no military involved, so it is civilians. The question, is it a population? I think indeed it's clear that uh, even more for the abductions than for the torture. We have uh, also seen that uh, torturing is also directed to some, uh, let's say, uh, common criminal uh, situations, to other situations, but those who were reported in our reports are directed, again, the same groups, the groups of uh, the Gulen movement, uh, the, the Turkish movement, and political opponents. Political opponents, a bit less than or less, it's most of all the Gulen movement and the Kurdish uh, movement, and for the abductions nearly exclusively, uh, the situation. Though civilian and population, I think that is, uh, let's say, uh, clear. However, the most important element, I think, is together with the last ones that we will uh, look at, sorry, yeah, is the third one, pursuant or in furtherance of a state or organizational policy. Forget about the organizational policy, that is in cases where the state is not longer functioning and that we have paramilitary situations, that's not our case. Our case is about state responsibility, state possibility, uh, policy, excuse me. This requirement is not present as such in customary international law. However, the systematic requirement in the customary international uh, law is nearly the same as the policy. It's not a big difference, actually. It's very close to each other. 
Um, what are the elements that we see in the jurisprudence? We see thoroughly organized as an element, a regular pattern, involving public resources, private resources, and also in the jurisprudence, it need not to be explicitly formulated or defined. We can deduct it from acts. We also see promoted or encouraged by the state. We also see a repeated action according to a same sequence, preparations, collective mobilization, and an attack which is planned, directed, or organized as opposed to spontaneous or isolated acts that satisfy the policy criteria. Uh, again, this conduct, course of conduct, is very close uh, to that. That's what we find in the jurisdiction until now. How can we apply that in the Turkish situation? And I find personally this is, but the other one, the course of conduct and against the civilian population, let's say this is not a, uh, something you have to break your head on. This one saying, is there a policy? It is indeed our view that uh, the state at different levels of power, and I emphasize this, is not needed. We do not need to have all the different levels, but I emphasize it, has actively promoted and encouraged a policy of torture and abductions, organized it, and used all the necessary resources to achieve certain objectives. Although it's not a requirement, some parts of the policy were also explicitly put forward. I know the, that this is a heavy, statement. It's a sharp statement. But I will try to explain why I came to that conclusion. The different levels first, what I have called here the non-ignorant legislator. There were clear warnings from international institutions that the law which defines terrorism as broadly as possible and is abused as has been explained by Judge uh, Perilli, by the, the justice, to put everything that's possible under terrorism as uh, Amnesty International. At the end, everyone who opposes the government can be considered as a terrorist. The legislation concern, uh, concerning prior authorization of prosecution of heavy, strong um, violations which mean that although in the law, torture and enforced disappearance for sure are sanctioned by heavy penal penalties, but laws who make it uh, depending on authorizations make that this law is nearly inoperative, as we saw from the figures. And also immunity legislations that has been put forward not only after the coup, where it has been said everyone after the coup who did something wrong, we forgive you, but also the MIT, the Secret Service, who clearly got an immunity uh, status for what they were doing. Uh, the witness, uh, the first witness uh, this morning also gave this letter for before they started to say, you will be cleared, you have no problem. This legislation, Knowing the consequences, they were informed of the consequences by international institutions and by the European Court of Human Rights who said, this is too broad, you cannot apply, it's against the principles. Still they maintained it. That's why I'm saying there is not non ignorant they did not do it because they didn't think about it. This legislation is not only a condition to continue with torture and with enforced disappearance, but it is an encouragement to do it. I cannot evaluate it differently. Secondly, the executive branch. We have an official zero tolerance. We have the statements in the report on torture that make me give an interpretation. It's an interpretation, I admit, where it said we have an official zero policy on torture. So. Torture cannot happen, so it should not be prosecuted. And the zero tolerance policy leads to a zero 
prosecution policy. It's clearly stated. The minister said we, we, do not, we do not need to. It cannot happen. And so this policy of zero torture is a bit easy as an excuse. Anyhow, we see there are allegations and there are very few convictions. But perhaps most, and that is not an interpretation, that's a fact, different reports, and also the, I must say, very credible uh, and strong testimony of uh, Mustafa Usben, who described this secret uh, facility where people are tortured and interrogated in specific ways, and also uh, reports and visits that has been made at a certain moment have declared that there were specific infrastructures. If you have specific structures for torturing, that means you have a policy to organize this to do it. Otherwise, you will not have an infrastructure. And I refer also to the CPT reports of the visits of 2017 and 19. So again, three years after the attempt of coup d'etat, where the CPT say there are specialized units, mobile units, UNUS brigades, who are specialized in torture and they intervene when it is needed to help and to make the torturing effective. If you have infrastructure and you have specialized forces, you're organized, you have a policy to do it. That's clear. And this is not an interpretation. The first was an interpretation. I admit this is facts beyond reasonable doubt. About the abductions, uh, Mr. Heymans made his report. I want to uh, emphasize that only those where we had uh, three different sources we could rely on that we kept. For instance, we had here uh, one of the witnesses who was explaining uh, the socialist work. It was four or five days. Uh, that we did not take it in the report. His case is not in the report because only the two weeks as a criterion was taken in account. It was very sharp. The 95 uh, abductions had, had to respond to a very sharp criterion. And I think the <coughs> very nature of these abductions, uh, the fact it is organized, we see planes are organized, uh, we see the way uh, I think it was uh, just from Westerners who said it's a very weird, weird way that people coming in without passport, they go to the passport control, and we see often they said, okay, you have your passport, we see you arriving here. It is an organized system, it's a policy, the people has to be informed. And for international abductions, we know the government says itself, it is our policy. It is our policy. We will find you everywhere. Even the president was declaring that. And I come to the third part of the judiciary. Um, it's uh, for a lawyer very, uh, very difficult to say, but we cannot otherwise than say that, uh, sorry, I have forgot here to go through, excuse me. The continuous actions of prosecutors and judges against clear decisions of the European court eh, in disrespect of basic, basic principles as fair trial, equality of arms, not accepting declarations where torture is claimed without uh, examining first that, that very clearly makes the judiciary co-responsible. There is, of course, an explication. We see that judges who dare to oppose this way of working or uh, contradicted openly by the, 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 the government, by the president even, we know that they are removed to other places. We are removed from the judiciary, they are put in jail some, that is explaining, and it is again confirming the policy of the executive branch, but that does not make it without responsibility. And I come to the conclusion on the existence of the attack. Uh, there is an attack, that's my opinion, consisting of a course of conduct involving the multiple commission of acts of torture and forced disappearance, directed against the civilian, a specific civilian population, pursuant or in furtherance of a policy promoted and encouraged by different levels of the state. Now the second stage is this attack existing. The attack must be widespread or systematic. That is the requirement uh, according to uh, customary law and codified by the Rome Statute. I insist it's alternatively, it is widespread or systematic. One of both, to be say, is enough. 
we will examine both and see what the conclusion is. The qualification, widespread or systematic, is applicable to the attack as a whole, not to each act separately, not to each kind of act. So we do not have to prove that torture is widespread or systematic and that abductions are widespread or systematic. It is the global attack that has to be widespread or systematic. And then, of course, if we go further, which not today, there has to be a, a proof that this each individual act has a nexus to these attacks and that someone is responsible for that. He knew it, he intended, and so on. But to say there is an attack, it is the global action that is, uh, uh, has to be evaluated, whereby widespread refers to the large scale na nature of uh, the attack and systematic to the organized nature of the acts of, of violence and the improbab improbability of their random occurrence, as said in the jurisprudence. I give some examples. Um, we had a first one here, uh, which was about a very large territory with thousands of civilians forcefully displaced, hundreds murdered, many raped, was considered as to be um, widespread. Also, at the third bullet, the village of Bogoro. Why is that important? That's a rather small village. And there were approximately 200 civilians killed. Why it's important? Because they took in account the fact that it's a small village and these 200 people were nearly whole the village. And they say that's widespread because the impact of the act on that village was very important. And we see that in the second bullet where they say it's not only a neither exclusive quantitative or geographical, but it must be carried out on the basis of these facts. And that is important for our situation. I think that is perhaps determining uh, our conclusion partly. Because what is our conclusion on this uh, for the Turkish situation? First of all, this widespread requirement, if we take the cited example of the ICC, the 3,000 torture cases per year, 50, 95 cases of enforced disappearance, we think this corresponds to what has been said in the ICC jurisprudence. Taking in account also, I must say that, what we have seen is the impact, indirect impact, which the European Court on the family already decided that the sufferance of the close family of the one who is tortured can be seen as torture itself. But I want to em emphasize one element because we have the numbers. We have the number, 3,000 a year torture. But you also have the continuing factor. It's from 2013, let's say, if we follow, and I see why, don't see why we would not, the analysis of uh, Judge uh, Perilli from 2013 to 2021, it's a continuum story. It's a continuum targeting of people. And that means that no one from the targeted groups can never and nowhere, because we have to do with torture, we have to do with abductions in Turkey, and we have to do with abductions outside uh, Turkey. So no one of this group can never and nowhere consider himself as safe. So the widespread character has also to do with the impact, who is massive, even global, on this group and where the government actually also says, and we will go on until we have them all. So the threat is more widespread even than the fact. And that has been testified here already. Someone said we are no nowhere safe. So I think that is a quite important element that I would emphasize. The numbers already are high, I, I, I feel a bit uncomfortable to say 3,000, but I have to emphasize a bit more, as if 3,000 people who are tortured a year is not enough, uh, but I think it's important the qualification to add that. The systematic, we see again in our uh, 
in our uh, situation, uh, in our jurisprudence, sorry, how it has been, it is a lot of repeat, non-accidental repetition of similar criminal conduct on a regular basis. I will not uh, repeat it all. Uh, we already have seen that the evidence demonstrating that preparations for the attack were undertaken in advance and that the attack was planned and coordinated uh, on uh, that part. I think that the conditions they put here are very close to what we said policy. I explained that under policy. Uh, and it's hard not to see that it is systematic also because it's not only a policy, not a policy towards a part of the targeted population, but systematic also wants to say it's a target to hold the population of the targeted groups. And again, until the targeted groups are destroyed, eliminated, eradicated, we will go on. And so that means the systematic element, uh, they, it doesn't stop. It still continues today. It doesn't stop until this global, thing, global target group. So my conclusion is in that, uh, that the attack, you can read it, is widespread and systematic. However, we know that crimes against humanity is a very hard, hard accusation. We know that some systems are not longer sufficient. The national systems in Turkey are not sufficient, and we also see that the European Court has huge problems to make the decisions executed. In the case of Kavala, there were already eight meetings of the, com the commission, Committee of Ministers, were three on the Demirtas cases. They are not executed. They do not let the two persons in case Kavala and Demirtas free. The, the existing system doesn't work. But does that mean the ICC, for instance, has a huge task? Is this now? is this priority. We know that crimes against humanity, we have the formal legal aspects that they gave, but also a question of what do we take first? Are there no other priorities? Is this a priority? It's something that even we would not like it, we have to take an account. Is this a priority? Is this a priority? And for that, I will show you a picture. This is Mr. Inandi. He was abducted from Kyrgyzia and President Erdogan. President Erdogan is uh, giving a press conference with the picture, and he's saying, we got it. We took Inandi through our embassy. We have testimonies from that. We illegally deported him to Turkey, and he's here, and we will catch them all. And even more important is this part of the picture. This man, which you see with his hand, he's holding his arm, I was with someone who immediately said, this man has been tortured. He cannot hold his hand, and his hand is double thick as the rest. There was an interview of Mrs. Vincianci, a forensic doctor, who said, it's clear. They are showing he's tortured. And afterwards, it's clear he broke his, his arm was broken in three places. He needed a surgery and so on. So what the president was showing here is, we can catch them. We can torture them, and you cannot come against it. It was the show of the power of abductions and torture. And that's why I think, indeed, it is priority. Because what is, cancer, what is here targeted? What is the most important? These abductions and tortures and the impunity and the impossibility of the existing system to really stop it are part of a tendency in the international legal order. And that's why the national international legal community and the national legal order, international legal order has to act. It is a tendency that in case of, it's now terrorism, but it can be everything, or so-called terrorism in Turkey, everything is allowed. And you can even show that you will do it, and you can say, no one can harm me. It is the situation that we had with the war crimes before the First and Second World War, who the winner could never be punished. Luckily, we got rid of that, and the war crimes can be prosecuted. We had the tribunals for that. It's now the situation. Those states who fight or say they will fight terrorism, whatever the terrorism is that they say, they can do anything without any 
state or individual responsibility. And I think that is the reason why it is a priority, because it will encourage, and it is already encouraging other countries to do the same, and it creates a complete situation of complete impunity with exactly the creation of crimes against humanity and the Rome Statute wanted to avoid is challenged now, and that is why, in my opinion, uh, the reaction against these crimes against humanity is priority for the international legal community. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor van der Lende. Thank you very much for this very extensive report and the extensive analysis of all the contextual elements uh, for crimes against humanity. You have said, and I think we can all agree with that, that a crime against humanity is a very hard, hard accusation. That's for sure. It's a very, very hard accusation. Maybe it's the, the most important one to, uh, in international criminal law. And you also pinpoint that the fact that uh, many cases against Turkey, maybe when the question my colleague will start with that, uh, are not implemented in the Council of Europe. So there is a problem there of implementation, of execution of many judgments of the European Court of Human Rights concerning uh, Turkey. So the question you put to, to this tribunal in your report is, do we need, and I insist on need, do we need to qualify the act of torture and abduction because they are the two main uh, acts, of course. As described in the report, and we discussed that the whole week, uh, as crime against humanity, according to the Rome Statute, I agree, in spite of the fact that, as you have recalled, that Turkey is not part of the Rome Statute. So that's for sure. So do we need, in, in the light of what uh, I just have said, my second question, and they are related, my second question, sorry to say that, but in your opinion, what would be the reaction and the defense of Turkey against the allegation that crime against humanity are taking place. So in order to see the other side of the situation. And my third question is the following one. If there are crime against humanity in Turkey, do you see any other ways to accountability for the perpetrators? Universal jurisdiction, other state, not ICC, because they are not part of the ICC. So that's the, my question for, for the time being. I didn't have the first question. The first question is uh, just that. You, re you recall that uh, crime against humanity is a very hard, hard, yes, yes, hard yes. accusation. That there are many problems in the Council of Europe for the implementation of the judgment against Turkey. So do we need, because that's exactly oh, the okay. word you use. So you note in page 385 of your report. Do we need, that's a question you put to us, do we need to qualify the acts of torture and uh, abduction as crime against humanity according to the Rome Statute. Okay, well, thank that's you very my much, uh, question. Yeah. Madam President. I think, yes, we need, because as what I explained, the classical ways of handling this national courts, international courts, the execution of the decision of international courts like European, the UN Committee, uh, Committee on Human Rights, they all failed, they decided. The UN Committee made uh, a view where it decided the persons abducted should be released. The European Court made statements, uh, made decisions that anti-terror law is not complying and the, the, the application anyhow is not uh, compliant, that people should be released. It didn't work. The Committee of Ministers is insisting it doesn't work. And we see that the international community for the moment does not react. States do not react whatever reason. So why do we need that? Because it is important that some reaction comes and without clearly defining what it is, because we're not inventing it. Eh? It's a hard accusation. As I said, we only started after one year of examining all the facts to say we have to challenge that. If we do not, we would not doing what we need uh, to do. And I really think we need to do uh, that. The defense of the Kurdish, uh, of the Turk, excuse me, excuse me very much, the Turkish government, how can I be, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the defense of the Turkish government will be, first of all, that uh, torture doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. They will say that again. Uh, I think it is evidence, but they will say all the judges have decided and they are independent. We heard different, that's what they will say. And 
I think also they will say it's not widespread. Uh, there is not 100,000 people who are killed. They will minimize it, I think, because legally it will be very difficult to say that is not. They will say, listen, there are a lot of problems in the world. Is that now the first problem in the world? That is the main, main defense. That, that's, that's always the case. Nothing is important until it is important. And that's why I, I want to emphasize if the international co legal community does not react, this is not the last case. It will go on. We already saw it in different places. It is a license for states to operate again without international control. Because the objective systems that say, state, you have a violation of human rights, you should repair it, which was the, orga which was the organization we had, in the thinking that if a state was condemned by the European court, they would follow, but that doesn't happen anymore. And that's a very changing situation. Uh, and, but they will minimize, that I'm sure. They will minimize. Uh, I think that's the way. Uh, the other ways, yeah, you have the national courts outside Turkey, and there are some procedures going on, but that's very, very meticulous, very specific. And of course, the judges in Turkey could do it themselves, but yeah, we know that that doesn't work. You have non-judicial actions like the Magnitsky Act, for instance, who could be uh, activated. So there are elements, but that's why a clear, and I, I think that the legal description I made, I think, is, is solid. I, we wouldn't have done it. I, I'm not intending to, to hear, uh, say something that afterwards you can be, be killed for, or not killed literally, but that they say it's, 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 it's a stupid reasoning. But we have a, a strong, solid case, but the importance must be emphasized. And there are other things. And as long as we do not have the case clearly defined, my Nixky Act's apl application will need that. And, and I hope they can build on that. To put some questions to our expert rapporteur. You? Okay, let's do it. Oh, pardon. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am not an expert on the um, concept of the crime of uh, crime against uh, humanity. <laughs> Two short questions. With regard to the civilian population, I take your point that it cannot just be a range of individuals, etc. And I apologize if I missed something in your report and your presentation. But do, does one have to be able to identify the specific part of the, of the um, civilian population? For example, Kurds, for example, members of the Gulen movement, but we heard in evidence when someone was asked, what does it mean when you say you're a member? He said, it simply means that I believe in good things. Uh, not, um, I don't have a membership card, I don't play, pay membership fees. So should one be able to identify accurately and clearly Kurds, the members of a movement, the members of a political party, the PKK, or just perceived opponents of the government? Uh, that is my first question. And the second one, I think relates to the question asked by the president. Um, in your view, and I'm sorry again if I missed something, should this tribunal, what should be the terminology? If we, if we generally agree with you, should this tribunal make a finding that it is a crime against humanity or decide that it is a decision or declare that it is or simply express an opinion that it could well be or that the essential elements are there and then leave it to other bodies, uh, perhaps with more specific focused authority to take it further. Thank you very much. Can I get the PowerPoint back, please? Because for, to answer the question, I will start with the second uh, question. If you can put the PowerPoint back, that would be helpful. Yes, it will take a bit of time. Wait, uh, okay. Yes. To your second question, actually, you cannot, you can, a tribunal, people's tribunal cannot say a crime has been committed. The crime means you have an author, you have a fact, and you have the link between who is a criminal link. We cannot say that. 
What I wanted to explain is that the fact, strong violation of human acts, namely torture and enforced disappearance, do meet the legal requirements, contextual elements, I set it between brackets because the contextual name, contextual elements is only in the Rome Statute, so why the legal requirements is for the, the, the general system, to meet the legal requirements needed to be considered as crimes against humanity. That is what I think is the conclusion that I made and that I uh, bring forward to you. I do not say, I, you cannot go further, that's clear, but this is the most important, but this allows now to see if the contextual elements as a prerequisite are there, then you can see who is responsible, do they have rejection, and this and this and that. That's so, I hope with that I responded uh, to the second question. For your uh, first question, I will try to go here. Yes, in the definition here given, uh, groups distinguishable, but they say here a group defined by its perceived political affiliation, and the term perceived is important. You, we do not have to prove that everyone who was targeted is a member, how difficult it could be of or uh, Gulen movement, for instance, or the PKK, or something else, but that they are perceived by the government as such, for instance, because they use the Asia Bank and the bylock the system, and they are perceived by them, and that's why they were targeted. That's what has to be defined. And we do not need to give clearly the definition, because indeed, as you said, it is not possible. Sorry, but here there may be more than one perceived political affiliation. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, and we can say you can have, it, it, it is a double, it's a double system, which made it even worse, of course. But uh, it has not to be, it is, the civil population can be more than one group. And they have one thing in common that they are, since 2013 actually, they have in common that they are in kind of an opposition, one way or another, to the government. But that's not the main element. They belong to that group, they were targeted, and they were... Then it goes quite wide, because then it would mean perceived to be politically opposed to the incumbent government. It is like that, but it is in one of these cases, for instance, it was clear that they say this group, because our ethnicity, are seen as they will not vote, and so, without saying that they voted or not, they were attacked, and that was considered as an attack against the civilian population, indeed. Thank you very much. Now I will turn to, John, to Justice Paces. Do you have any question? You have the floor, if you I, I do, but um, first of all, thank you very much, Professor. That was a very impressive and inspiring presentation. Um, I appreciate the dynamics involved that are necessary in order to characterize the situation we are examining uh, as spinning off elements of crimes against humanity. Um, my question is more geared to uh, the potential follow-up. Assuming that um, the evidence shows a consistent pattern, a policy, if you like, but certainly a practice uh, which would um, contain all the elements requisite for to, to conform to a crime against humanity. And uh, given the fact that uh, the country concerned is not, a, adhere, is not a state party to the Rome Statute, but maybe um, this tribunal will need to undertake very serious reflections on uh, if it finds that there are those elements, uh, which way the tribunal would suggest that the focus goes, admitting that uh, we have agreed that there is a need to um, amplify focus because, if anything, the existing international and forget the local mechanisms have been tried and tested and the situation has not been affected at all on that assumption. So do you have any ideas or views or vision as to um, the, how and in w what uh, formal context, if, po if possible, would uh, the next uh, uh, area, the next step uh, be, in your view? Yes. Um, there are several ones. First of all, 
um, the qualification as crimes against humanity means that every national court has a larger jurisdiction than towards uh, ordinary crime. For the national jurisdictions, the conditions to persecute a crime against humanity, as far as prescription, for instance, is concerned, but also as far as the conditions of presence on the territory of the victim and uh, the perpetrator are not the same. Uh, they differ for each country a bit, but there are, there, the, there are broader possibilities for the national courts, and we already see that some preparations are made. Uh, here and there, but it's difficult. And the most countries have had experiences with universal jurisdiction and have came, come back a bit from that because of uh, difficult experiences. But that's the first, the national court. The second element is that um, the ICC, the Rome Statute, has not been approved by Turkey. That's right, that's not ratified. However, in, uh, and it's still a bit in a preliminary phase, but uh, the situation of the Rohingya where the Myanmar expelling country, if I can say, is not ratified the statute. However, the receiving country, it's Bangladesh, I think, has ratified. The ICC has said, as this crime continues to be committed in, uh, in, uh, Bang in Bangladesh, we have competence, we have jurisdiction. That means for these international abductions who start from a country that has ratified the Rome Statute, the ICC has jurisdiction. And there are 11. There are 11 abductions from countries which have ratified the ICC. So, we can try. The whole <laughs> attack is Turkey and all the rest. But these 11 are falling in the jurisdiction and we cannot deny that. That's the second. The third element, as I said, when you have crimes against humanity as an element in all the Magnitsky Act, uh, United States, UK, Europe, is a determining factor, determining factor to say, listen, if that occurs, we can activate that Magnitsky Act. As you know, the Magnitsky Act makes a uh, possibility to limit uh, people tra uh, traveling and to freeze some assets. So I think, yes, we have a follow-up at the national level. Possible, we have a lot of work still has to be done, a possibility at the ICC level, and there is a possibility at the Magnitsky level, and I must uh, say you, after two years' work, and knowing what happened this week, we will not stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for this. Uh As you say, Justice Perche, very inspiring uh, intervention on a very difficult uh, uh, subject matter, crime against humanity. Okay, thank you very much. So, voila, the morning is over. Uh, we will meet each other this afternoon at 2 for the video uh, on, on, on... On the subject Voila, exactly. So we meet at 2, is it okay? Is it not too short time? Okay. A small, a small lunch, okay? A quick lunch, <laughs> and then we meet it at two for the video, and then uh, I will say something uh, about uh, the, the, the deliberation and uh, the last uh, meeting on Friday. So we meet at two, and thank you very much for your presence here. <laughs>